to call us back to order. Delegates, please take your seats. We'll begin with a few housekeeping details. A reminder with regard to the advisory committees that will be meeting over lunch. At this point, that's advisory committees number two, number nine, and number four. So committees two, four, and nine. And committee number four will get your food, take it to room 214 of the Commons Annex by the dining hall. So committee four, you will meet in room 214 with your meals. Committee nine, similarly, will meet in the alumni dining room in the common annex. And advisory committee number two, I'm not sure if you've chosen a place, but advisory committee number two will also be meeting over lunch. We have previously welcomed a number of our ecumenical guests. In the meantime, a few more guests have arrived. And we don't quite have everyone here yet, but by tomorrow when we will entertain the presentations from our ecumenical guests, we trust that they will all be present. But at this point, we have the opportunity to add our welcome to those who were previously welcomed. And in addition, now present, our ecumenical officer, Reverend Monica Scott Pierce from the Reformed Church in America, Please stand. Welcome. <laughs> Reverend William Julius, scribe of the Uniting Reformed Church in Southern Africa. <laughs> and stated clerk, Reverend Hiratsugu Mochida, of the Reformed Church in Japan. Thank you very much and welcome. May you enjoy your time here and we are delighted by the privilege of hosting you here at our Synod. Delegates, we are now going to return to the item that we placed on the agenda for this time slot earlier this morning. And so that brings us back to the consideration of materials before us from the Advisory Committee 9A. And we are going to welcome uh, in our presence here this morning three members of the Study Committee, Reverend Jeff Wyma, Reverend Mary Lee Bauma, and Matt Tuninga, welcome. And we invite the three of you first to make the presentation that you have planned for us and then lead us into an explanation of how our table discussions will proceed. We have up to 90 minutes for this. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. President, for welcoming us and giving us this opportunity to speak before everyone. Uh, presentation may lead to expectations that will disappoint you, but uh, we will have maybe 20 minutes first of general introduction to a bunch of things related to our report. And then we, as a committee, really wanted to give delegates ample opportunity to have a voice in this process and to respond to the interim report that is before you. So we'll spend maybe about 20 minutes of us, the three of us, and then we'll turn it over to you for your responses. Three things that I would like to share and for you to think about as you engage in this process. And the first one is entitled, Interim Report Means Interim Report. And I stress that because um, our committee was given an unusually wide-ranging mandate, and because of that, uh, Synod, uh, the previous one, decided to give us five years, which is 
highly unusual instead of the normal three. And then as a result of that extended period, they required us to come this year with an interim report, and now we're fulfilling that uh, requirement. Now, we had two options as a committee. One option would be simply to give you uh, a minimal amount of material. I could stand before you and say, we met X number of times. These are the people with whom we met. These are the things we're thinking about. See you later. However, there is a second option, and that is to give you more substantive material. And we really felt we needed to do that because the previous synod, that is 2016, uh, which mandated this process, quote, said we had to give a written summary in order for Synod 2019 to dialogue with and provide feedback to the committee. And so the primary purpose this morning is for you to do just that, to dialogue with and to provide feedback to us as committee members. Now, even though we've given you uh, uh, not a lot, we have given you still, I think, some substantive material. And as a result, I I think that people have misunderstood the idea of interim. So interim is not used with the idea that what you have before you is the basic core of our mandate, and then we're going to tweak it, you know, in light of whatever observation you and others give. That would be a misunderstanding of our interim report. Actually, there are three or four large substantive sections which are still forthcoming. So, for example, we anticipate in our full report a whole section dealing with the topic of transgender or gender dysphoria, another whole area dealing with pornography, a third area dealing with same-sex attraction or same-sex sex, sex, and then perhaps another uh, section dealing with a variety of related topics such as premarital sex, cohabitation, singleness, celibacy, polyamory, sexual assault, and so forth. So what I'm really trying to stress is that what you have before us is indeed only preliminary. I say that because some people have responded, not just to us, but some in print, and say, no, the committee was supposed to do this, and it didn't do that, or they failed to address this area or that. And so uh, we're well aware of that because that wasn't really the goal or the purpose of our interim report. That's the first point. Uh, Interim report means interim report. Secondly, who are we? Uh, It may be of interest for you to know a bit more about the makeup of the committee. And I say that because some have complained that the previous synod required that our members be made up of those who, quote, adhere to the CRC's biblical view of marriage and same-sex relationships. And some have complained about that and thought, therefore, the committee would be biased or not open or take seriously alternative or challenging interpretations. Now, they themselves anticipated this complaint, and so that's why I remind you that they required that we also appoint a promoter fide, or in colloquial terms, a devil's advocate. And we have a person who serves on that committee. I hits me now, I maybe shouldn't mention her name after just using the word devil's advocate, but Dr. Mary Stewart Van Leeuwen has been a very active and vocal and extremely helpful member on our committee, and I think it's important for you to be aware of that. Also, I hope that you understand that as academics and as pastors, our integrity requires that we don't hide or distort evidence, even if it maybe goes in directions that we are not so initially excited about. And finally, let me tell you that uh, as co-chair, I've had to um, negotiate very vigorous, very animated discussions even within our own uh, committee. Let me also stress the diverse nature of our committee, again in keeping with what Senate 2016 required. Our relatively small committee is made up of who? Well, we have an African-American pastor, an Hispanic pastor, a Korean pastor, three faculty members from Calvin Seminary, a same-sex attracted person, a philosopher, a social scientist, and as I've already indicated, the promoter FIDE. So I'm just anticipating some complaints or concerns that the complexity of arguments that have been presented on biblical matters, on uh, sociological or scientific matters, we are indeed thinking carefully about such things. The third and final part of my uh, presentation is thanks for your feedback. 
So as soon as our presentation is done, the primary purpose this morning is to hear from you as representatives of the church. And I want you to hear us to say that we are eager for your feedback. Of course, we've already gotten feedback from individuals and from others in the denomination, and that can continue. But now you as representatives of the Christian Reformed Church of North America, both in the United States and in Canada, have a wonderful opportunity to voice your opinion and to allow us to hear some of your happiness, some of your frustrations, some of your concerns. And I promise you that we have and will continue to pay careful attention to what you say. Now, having said that, let me anticipate a disappointment you will no doubt have, because in a few moments, uh, we're going to engage, you will, in roundtable discussion, and you're going to get going and voice those uh, things that are perhaps uh, deeply held by you, and then, then maybe nothing, right? Because our committee is going to meet actually already later this week, and that's where we'll take up those responses, and you may be disappointed that well, you can't let other delegates hear what, those re what your comments were, or somehow we as a committee won't be able to respond to you. And so I'm just asking you to be patient and not to be too disappointed and to again promise you that we take and value your feedback seriously. And again, already this week, our committee is meeting again next week or this week, Friday and Saturday, and we'll be very uh, pleased to, uh, to hear from you. So the third and final thing I'll say at this point before turning it over to Mary Lee Bauma is to say thank you in advance for reading our report. Our, what report? Our interim report. Yes, there's much, much more. Believe me, I'm a little daunted by the fact that there's much, much more to come. And so I, I thank you in advance for your efforts serving not just us as a committee, but the larger denomination of which we are a part. Thank you, Dr. Wyma. Welcome, Mary Lee. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work, hey? You could pray for us. <laughs> We've been working and working, um, and we're going to be working and working a lot more, so please Please pray for us. I know many of you are and have been, and we've had people come up to us. Um, but yeah, we sure need your prayers. But we all need the prayers, don't we? And um, that's kind of what this, what I want to say a little bit, is that the preamble part, I'm, I'm discussing that for a minute, and then Matt will talk about the biblical um, overview, the overarching um, biblical theology. But we need each other. And that's, I think, what this, what this piece of the report really is all about. First, it begins with, there's a focus on the goodness of our bodies. And I think in this time of, um, of virtual living, in so many ways, that the creation theology, a theology of our bodies, is so needed to recover. The idea that in physical time and space, we need each other, we need to be together, and we are helpful to each other. We are helpful to each other over food and gardening and being with each other with physical affection. We need each other physically uh, in so many ways. And Jesus, of course, came down and became one of us. And we're not embodied spirits, right? We are made in God's image. Um, we don't just have bodies on top of our spirits and then we'll dispense with our bodies, but Jesus is up in heaven created, right? And that's what, he's still a creature, right? He's up there with a human body uh, on. And I, I think that's what we're trying to stress here is that we are physical and our bodies are good, but we are also obviously really struggling in our bodies, in our churches, all of our churches. Somebody asked us in the advisory committee about the stories here and where the stories came from. And the stories came from a variety of contexts and ministry settings. But I said to that group, if, if your church is bigger than 40 or 100 people, you've got these stories, uh, the first stories I'm talking about now, you've got these stories in your church. And Lord willing, you're on your way to the stories at the end as well, the stories of hope and the stories of new beginning. So, um, yeah, the first thing is just that uh, although we're struggling, we've been made good in, in, good, in God's image, and sex is good. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about how good it is all the time. I don't mean every single sermon needs to be about sex. That's not what I'm saying. But we don't got hardly any sermons about sex. We don't got hardly any sermons about celibacy. You know what I'm saying? 
we need to talk about this stuff. We need to talk about all of it. The culture's talking about all the way. I remember doing a series on, preaching a series once on sexuality and getting hassled. I was, I was visiting a church and doing a visiting series and getting hassled by people that maybe what I was saying in the church would be offensive to their children or problematic for their children. I was just reading scripture texts and then talking about them. I wasn't using any vulgar words, but I said to them, you know, in the car on the way home on their smartphone in the back seat, they're to encounter much more intense stuff than anything. I said, we need to talk about it. So that's partly what we're talking about in this report, is we need to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Um, but then the second piece of this preamble is just all about who we are. And uh, I assume you read the report well. Um, Jesus taught a radical new thing, a new community of brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters to each other, being family of God, brothers and sisters to him, that the church isn't built on families. We talk in our churches about being built on families, and that's not biblical. We are the family, and we've got to have that new kind of language and we talk in here, uh, pages 410, 411, for instance, we talk in here about um, rejecting that kind of notion that marriage and family are the core of the church and assuming this primary identity as family with each other. In other words, on Christmas, who do you want to be with? You want to be with your family, right? So churches often maybe worship for a minute, and then off they go to be with their biological families. But there are many churches now across our denomination who are saying, we are family. And so they're together on Christmas. They're together on Easter. They're together on all those times. They're eating together. They're cooking together. We are family. And that's what this is talking about. Um, Stephen Coy asked us to identify ourselves the other day. And every one of us was willing to identify ourselves as fallen sinners and hypocrites because it's, it's just so obvious and it'd be kind of embarrassing if you were the one who hadn't had your hand raised because the people who know you would know otherwise, right? So we are fallen sinners, but boy, we got to help each other because the story doesn't stop there. We've been forgiven, we've been justified, but we're also being sanctified, amen? And we are part of the process of helping each other be sanctified, and that's what this report is partly talking about and the preamble is talking about. The way of celibate singleness and, uh, and monogamous marriage is a difficult way. We are struggling in our churches, all of us. The majority of us are struggling with those things. We are struggling with that stuff. And it's weird to the culture around us, just bizarre. But it was equally as bizarre to the first century church. And... Uh, we're just becoming more like the first century in many ways, and we talk about that now, don't we? About how we're becoming more and more different from our culture. But, and this is the last part of the preamble, but we are these beautiful communities, and we can be these beautiful communities who, because of our Reformed tradition, we, we have a line here where we say, um, in each of our congregations, in various ethnic and economic context, the Christian Reformed Church has a living tradition of deep love for the scriptures, coupled with a willingness to engage courageously with the ideas of our time. Because we know the creator who made all things and the reconciler who brings all things together, we can create nurturing places for people wrestling with sexual identity, deep brokenness, long-term patterns of sin, and disconcerting cultural changes, and much, much more. I mean, we can be that for each other. And I'm hearing stories during Synod today, and I know of stories of intentional communities, of households, of neighborhoods where people are loving people physically in real time in their neighborhoods, in urban centers and apartments like where I live, in condos where people are living together, choosing to live together, singles and couples living together. It's a radical new thing that Jesus said, and he lived it out as a celibate man. We need to create a place for that, and we need to say to the world, we're all welcome. Because when we do this, people are going to come in who are in polyamorous relationships. People are going to come to us. People are going to come to us who are from all different stages and places of sexual brokenness. We won't just be healed ourselves. 
but we will be indeed what God made us to be. So I want to just finish um, by reading Exodus 19, a bit a, a verse that's echoed in 1 Peter 2. In Exodus 19, God said to the people of Israel on their way out of Egypt, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, kingdom and holy nation. You will be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. And then in 1 Peter, Peter echoes that same thing, and you know it. He says to us, Come to him then, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Individual stones. Individual stones. So individuals, absolutely. And yet then community built together into this house. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Didn't mean to preach, but I'm just saying this is what this report is all about. So pray for us, and we look forward to all your interactions about this. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. Matt? So I'm going to say a few things about the biblical portion of the interim report. And mainly they revolve around three things. Uh, the first one is just the purpose of it. And I want to emphasize that the, the purpose of the biblical summary was not to engage in exegetical controversies or deeply get involved in particular moral controversies or, or pastoral issues or theological um, disputes. It was actually to avoid getting too sucked into that because that would kind of kill the readability and focus of the narrative. What we wanted to do was to present a overarching narrative, really a story, that was readable across the church, uh, readable for people who aren't just academics or are not, haven't, haven't gone to seminary, um, but want to have a good sense of where does sexuality fit in this big story that God is telling of creation, fall, redemption, new creation, or restoration. And by doing that, we hoped that we wouldn't approach this as a church by starting with the issues and then going to sort of argue them out from Scripture, look for proof texts for this or that opinion that perhaps we already hold, but to kind of step away from the issues and the controversies and listen to the whole arc of Scripture in a Christ-centered, gospel-centered way and see what it has to tell us and let that be the foundation for our considerations and our conversations. And in that sense, we took seriously the mandate um, that, that the core of our committee was not to deal with any particular issue, but to articulate a foundation-laying biblical theology. So there will be all manner of things in that summary, in that narrative, that you will wish for more on. And you'll say, well, they didn't, they didn't bring up this text, or they didn't deal with this argument, and, and we know that, and a lot of that is still coming although we simply will not be able to do absolutely everything. So, but we'll try. Uh, the second thing I want to say is about the genre of the biblical part. And here I want to just emphasize that we are not presenting a systematic theology of sexuality or of marriage, but a biblical theology of sexuality and marriage. If we were doing this from a more systematical or historic perspective, we, we would have approached it very differently. We would have talked perhaps through the, the classic way that Christians have talked about the three goods of marriage and what marriage is and the different purposes for which God's made it and, and done that in a very systematic way that, that deals with all the different issues that might arise. But that's not what we are trying to do. Rather, again, we're trying to explore the biblical story, um, the, the history of what God is doing in redemption. And so that means that there's going to be development in the story. 
It's going to be dynamic. There will be things in one part of the story that maybe sit in a little bit of tension with things in the other part of the story, and we're not necessarily at this point going to explain all that and iron that out. We might let the tension sit. For instance, as Christians, we're right now caught between this age and the coming age, the already and the not yet, and that that infuses the Christian life with tension, and so any good biblical theology will have that kind of tension, and that's okay. We should have that as the church. And so, for example, you'll notice that in the part on creation, Genesis 1 and 2, there's a fair bit about procreation mentioned there. But when you get to the New Testament part, there really isn't much said about procreation. Or you'll notice that in the Old Testament section, there doesn't seem to be much of a place for celibacy. But in the New Testament section, there's a whole area of the, of the summary devoted to celibacy. So we have to wrestle with what some of those tensions mean. But what's at the core of it all, because we're looking at this through a story, is that there is an overarching theme, there's a common thread, and that is that sexuality is and always has been at the heart of what it means to be human, and it's at the heart of God's purposes for us. And that's consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Sexuality is really important to this story of creation, fall, redemption, new creation. And, and it's, it's almost as if the scriptures can't talk about the gospel and its implications without talking about sexuality and marriage. And that's a, that's a very important thing for us to notice. Finally, third, I want to say something about our hope regarding the biblical summary. It's our hope that people will not be able to read this and think, well, that's what the church has always said and done. That's the traditional thing. Nor that they would read this and say, this is calling us to where the church needs to go. This is the progressive thing. We kind of want the biblical part to upset all the status quo and all the commitments that we already have by forcing us to come to grips with God's word, the gospel. And it really strikes me that when Jesus taught about matters pertaining to sex and marriage, the response of the disciples was shock. It was, well, if that's the case, who should get married? It was no sense whatsoever that Jesus was saying something expected. What Jesus is saying about sex and marriage is at the heart of what it means to take up our cross and follow him. It's part of the radical path of discipleship, and that's true no matter who you are. I would be worried if you came to me and said, I read through the whole biblical summary and found nothing that challenged or convicted me. Whether it's speaking about marriage and divorce, whether it's speaking about celibacy, whether it's speaking about the ultimate meaning of marriage, pointing us towards God's call, as Mary Lee was talking about, to greater communion with one another. In all these ways, it should convict us that our churches, all of our churches, are falling far short. And and in this sense, we hope that the biblical section ties back into the first section of the report to lead us all as a collective church not to see this as a moment to deal with a controversial topic or issue, but rather as a moment to confess our sin, our collective sin before God, confess how much we have failed in our sexuality and marriage, how much we have failed to witness to the gospel in our culture, and to commit together to sitting down again and saying, what is God calling us to do to walk in the path of the gospel? In other words, it's a moment to once again uh, learn together what it means to be the church, what it means to bring hope to the world. So that's our, that's, that's our hope for the interim report. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. So before uh, Reverend Bauma will lead us in prayer, I'd like to give you the instructions for now the role that you're going to play. If you go to your home page at the Synod site, and at the home page, 
look for the heading announcements. And then under announcements, you'll see another heading, feedback on 2019 interim report. So again, homepage, announcements, and then feedback on the 2019 interim report. You will see the instructions ask that one on your table is assigned as the reporter. And so one person will keyboard in the responses of the people around the table. Uh, you are encouraged but not required to sign your class's name. Uh, that's up to you. But with those instructions, I think you're ready to go, except again, I'd like to invite uh, Reverend Bauma to lead us first in a time of prayer. That's the first time I've been called Reverend Bauma in I don't know how long. But, um, as we go to pray, we're going to pray right now in inviting the Holy Spirit in a time of silence. But in your groups... After you've had vigorous discussion, and I'm guessing you'll have some real disagreements with each other or concerns, um, maybe some thanksgiving, but as you have that time together, will you, will you out of the hour, save out at least five minutes at the end to just have a, a, an open time of prayer for the church, for each other, um, not a time where you ask each other all your concerns, but simply that you respond to the discussion with a time of prayer. So, but let's invite the Holy Spirit of God to come. We want to be still a moment and know that you are God. We want to be still a moment, God, and ask you to come and speak to each of our hearts. Come and enable us, as we speak to each other, to listen to your spirit in each other and for each of us to be tuned in to your spirit ourselves. So come now as we, in silence, Wait for you. Loving, gentle, generous, powerful Holy Spirit who illuminates Jesus, come among us. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're invited to have the one reporter fill out the form for you all as you and after you discuss. You have one hour. Sorry, hold up. Uh, I thought Jeff had said it earlier. This is meant to be by two classes, so eight people, right? So each, isn't each table sort of, we were thinking tables were by eight. So two classes, which is why it says classes at the top of the form instead of classes. Um, so yeah, eight of you. So if you need to regroup, whatever you need to do to be able to hear each other well, the eight of you. Is that clear? One more interruption, one more interruption. If you opened the survey form a few minutes ago, it indicated classes was required, and then it was mentioned that it wasn't necessary, so that requirement has been taken off, but you will have to refresh, perhaps, to get to the form with that change, so.
there's, there's power, a whole power bar strip. <laughs> I am asked to make clear to you that there's one reporter for the table. So you can all see the questions, but if, if you could just talk amongst yourselves and then one person answers, that way you're talking together. If you're filling in the form, you're not talking together. So will you talk together, but first ask one person to be that reporter. Is that clear? Okay. Thank you. 
just, just say, if you haven't submitted yet, maybe copy and paste it. Okay. Could I have your attention, please? Before you hit the submit button in a few minutes, there's a word of caution. Apparently, with a Google form like this, it can time out. And there's one group that hit the submit button and then lost all the information they had typed. So, don't panic. Don't quickly try to hit the submit button to beat the deadline. Before you hit the submit button, do a copy and paste into another file. So copy and paste it, and then try to submit it, and that way you won't lose all of your good work. Okay? And uh, sorry to interrupt, but we had to do that before others start hitting the submit button, and then it's too late to save your material. If you need help from IT on that, if you're a little bit uh, wary that you might lose it, raise your hand and IT will come and help you to do a copy-paste into a backup document before you try to submit. Okay?
Sisters and brothers, if you have not had time to pray yet, we've just got a few minutes left to wrap up your comments. And then if you would take five minutes to pray with each other and remembering that we have to be back here at 1135. So take a few minutes to wrap up and then do spend some time listening to the Spirit or pleading with God together.
podium. Maybe Jose. Okay. Uh, Jose's on the committee. Do we have prayer in a few minutes for lunch? And I can ask that person. That's good. Yeah, That's I'll, good. I'll, I'll that. So I'll just make my announcement. You make the announcement. Make my yeah. <clears throat> We'd like to have your attention, please, as we give the floor again to Reverend Harry Lee Bauma. <laughs> wow, three times in one morning. Um, we, we, I just noticed that so many people who were here have, have left, um, but hopefully this will get passed on to them as well. Um, in addition to those who are delegates here, of course there are all kinds of people who are part of this body who care about what this committee is doing. And so if you know of people or you are a person who's still here, um, please know that you can reach out to our committee. Um, members of our committee can come and be with. You can come to our committee. You can come speak to us. You can um, write us, uh, email us. So please, uh, please do do that. Reach out to us if you would like to. Um, I noticed that someone took, uh, someone went and interacted with a group of observers today to get some of their input and looks like we're going to get that as well electronically, so that's great. But please do feel free to tell people uh, that they can do that. I wanted to just end with these words. Paul says in Romans 12 that we are one body, all one body, and each one members of it. And similarly in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are a community and we are individuals. And he says that when one member suffers, all suffer with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Thank you, Mary Lee. Also, thank you to Jeff and to Matt for leading us, us in this um, exercise this morning. Our prayer before lunch will be said in a little while by Caleb, and so we're going to assume that Caleb will also be including uh, this part of our morning in that concluding prayer before we go to lunch. Uh, before we do break for lunch, we still have about 10 minutes. And uh, this is the order of the day. We will now move to Report 7A, and it's our anticipation that immediately after lunch, we will take up 1A. <clears throat> after we return for lunch, we'll give you a further heads up in terms of order of reports as they'll uh, come before us. But for now, we will go to 7A anticipating 1A after lunch, and at that time, we'll also give you further input in terms of the sequence. Drew. Thank you. Committee 7 has a bit of a reputation for being, oh, shall we say, uninteresting. And so, uh, Mr. President, I can assure you that there's nothing in this presentation that will threaten that reputation. <laughs> I know that John Bolt loves that reputation, so let's maintain it. All right, 7A contains um, a number of recommendations. First one is this, that Synod receive as information the condensed financial statements of the agencies and educational institutions so move. The motion is before you. Discussion to the motion. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. 
Opposed, same sign. That's carried. Recommendation two is that Synod receive the agency's and institutional unified budget as information and approve a ministry share of $346.48 for calendar year 2020. So moved. That motion is before you. Discussion? Discussion on recommendation two? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's carried. Recommendation three, that Synod adopt the 2019-2020 denominational salary grid for senior positions as proposed, and the reference is included. So moved. Any discussion on recommendation three? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. It is carried. For recommendation four, uh, we considered these individually in committee, and so I'd like to consider them individually here. Granted. Let Senate adopt the following recommendations with reference to agencies requesting to be placed on the recommended for offerings list. A, that Synod ratify the list of above ministry share and specifically designated offerings for the agencies and institutions of the CRC and denominationally related ministries and recommend these to the churches for consideration. So moved. Any discussion on recommendation 4A? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign. Carried. B, that Synod ratify the list of non-denominational agencies previously accredited that have been approved for calendar year 2020. So moved. Discussion on 4B. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed, same sign. Carried. And C, that Synod ratify inclusion of the following organization on the accredited agency list. That agency is the Colossian Forum, and the grounds are indicated below. So moved. Discussion on 4C. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Opposed, same sign. Carried. Recommendation five, that Synod take note of the COD's endorsement of the following actions of the pension trustees. A, the three-year average salary to be used to determine retirement benefits beginning in 2020 for ministers of the word in the United States is $54,054, and in Canada is $56,140. And B, that the 2020 per member assessment for the Canadian plan remain $42.96, and that the Canadian per participant assessment remain 9840 Similarly, that the 2020 per member assessment for the U.S. plan remain $37.20, and the U.S. per participant assessment remain $7,704. So moved, hoping everyone understood that. Discussion on recommendation 5A and B. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Carried. Moving into section two, related to the Christian Reformed Church Loan Fund, our sole recommendation there is that Synod receive the report of the Christian Reformed Church Loan Fund for information and adding that we applaud the work of the Loan Fund and encourage the churches to make use of its services. So moved. Discussion on recommendation 2C. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. That is carried. Section three, pensions and insurance, we have two recommendations. The first is that Synod designate up to 
100% of a minister's early or normal retirement pension or disability pension for 2020 as housing allowance for United States income tax purposes, but only to the extent that the pension is used to rent or provide a home. So moved. Discussion on C1. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. It's carried. And recommendation two, if Synod 2019 approves a meritation of commissioned pastors as recommended by the candidacy committee, that Synod instruct the pension trustees to evaluate retirement program options for commissioned pastors. So moved. Discussion on C2. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, same sign. That is carried. That concludes 7A. Thank you, Drew. So that completes our work with 7A. As announced previously, after we recess for lunch and return, we will turn to 1A. Reminder that Advisory Committees 2, 4, and 9 will work over lunch. And I believe that Caleb is going to come and lead us in our prayer before lunch. Please return promptly after lunch uh, to start our afternoon session on time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our awesome, loving, most wise God, we we thank you for this time of uh, deliberation on uh, important, critical matters of the church. We we thank you, Lord, that uh, you've made us in your image, and that encompasses so much. And one of the ways uh, we are image bearers that we are uh, we are grateful that you've given us rational minds to be able to ponder things. And so we pray that your spirit of wisdom would be anointing us with your presence as we deliberate on on big, complex issue. And we thank you that, God, you are the God of the infinite, awesome in, in, in scope and wonder, transcending all of our our thoughts and our actions. And while you're a God of intimate, you are the God of the intimate as well. You, you speak to us lovingly, carefully, meet us in our times of need and where we're at. And we need you more than ever, Lord, as we would look at these items before Synod at this time. So we thank you as well that your Holy Spirit has been poured out on us and this is a spirit of love and uh, that you've given us, taken away our heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh. So we pray now that while we may have strongly differing attitudes and opinions, even as we read your word and come to uh, different conclusions, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be guiding us as we consider these issues. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of order and that you, you've given us through the wisdom of many people before a church order, and we thank you for our time in this, of looking at the church order, how our church can work better and more responsibly to the needs of your church. This church, sweet Jesus, this church that you loved enough to give your life for, Yes, even the, the apple of your eye. You love the church so much. And as we considered the adoption this morning, as we considered our brokenness yesterday, 
And yet in our brokenness, you didn't leave us there. You called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. And now, we've, as we consider our adoption as sons and daughters, when we believe we have the right to be called children of God, it is so precious. So we thank you that this church, the bride of Christ, you loved us enough to give yourself. You're the, uh, all authority has been given to you, Jesus, on heaven and heaven on earth. So we thank you that you are the head of this church. We thank you for now this time to look at what that looks like in our church order. And we thank you so much for the, the people that have served you long and the, as we talked about earlier and, and, and clapped and, and considered the years of service of those that have retired, people that heard the call, people that, that say, served faithfully knowing that standing firm in the Lord, that our labor is not in vain, that many people served, they persevered, and you preserved them. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for the synodical services that, that, that helps to do the order, the orderly working out of business in this, in this your church. We thank you. We thank you that, uh, that the what would appear dry to some of us is so important. Financial matters, Lord, that you are a generous God, that every, not only spiritual gift, but every physical gift has been given as well. So we pray that we would honor you in how we consider finances and good stewards of all that you've given. You are rich beyond compare. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. The gold is yours. The silver is yours. Oh, Lord, we thank you, and you are so generous. May we be good stewards of what you've given. And almighty God, we ask blessings on this, uh, this committee work on uh, human sexuality as we look at uh, as image bearers. We look at, yes, our brokenness and these relationships. We look at that you, God, have, through salvation, through you, you've justified us. You've put us in a right standing before you. You've forgiven us of our sins. And then that work of sanctification, that the spirit being sanctified by word and spirit, we are on this journey towards sanctification, towards holiness and unity, Lord, in your high priestly prayer. You prayed for our unity. And Lord, sometimes these issues can divide. We pray now that we would be deliberating well as we consider these that we would be able to speak the truth and love that the spirit of love would be on us this wisdom that that you would be blessing our deliberations you would be blessing our talks over coffee over lunch and that even though we are not considered representative in the body that we would go back to our churches and continue the dialogue to be able to to speak lord relationally that there is a brokenness of our people outside our church and, and even in the church that are, that are wanting to be a part of this body and feel excluded. Lord, would we be a loving, deliberative body as we consider these important, awesome <coughs> issues at hand. Lord, bless our deliberation. Now bless this food to strengthen and nourish us and refresh us with a renewed uh, spirit and strength for the uh, task at hand this afternoon. Awesome, Father God, we pray this, and, uh, and would we pray as you taught us to pray as well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.